What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. It's time for another episode of Wednesday Afternoon Worship and it's another third party deity today. Mr. AJ Parker requests we crack open the gods of Porphyria. Let's talk about the martyr herself, Tulis. If you guys are liking what you're seeing, remember to hit that like and subscribe button. If you have any requests for this series or any other series, in the comments they go. And remember that patronage at any tier gets your request straight to the front of the line today. This episode of Wednesday Afternoon Worship was brought to you in part by Lord Manant. Thanks for your help, friend. Now, let's talk about some third-party deities. Which, of course, by the way, we've homebrewed obediences for, we've homebrewed boons for, and it's gonna be sweet now, Tulis. So Purple Duck Games has their own mythos, and we're gonna dive straight to Tulis herself's legend. The story goes that she was a poor woman and served him to a landowner by the name of Roderick, whose attention fell upon her. She refused him, and when he asked why, Tulis said that his heart was twisted and incapable of love. Oh, just like me. Neat. Roderick took offense at this and took Tulis prisoner. He attempted to force her to love him at the beginning with words and gifts, progressing to threats and torture, but to his frustration, any wound he inflicted upon her healed overnight. Roderick became convinced that Tulis did not feel pain and was just mocking him. What Roderick didn't know was that was only a fraction of Tulis's power. Every night before she healed, she would shed her chains and walk amongst the people, showing them exactly what Roderick had done to her. As one can imagine, the population was much moved against this and eventually rose up. With control of his land lost, Roderick attempted one final victory, tying Tulis to the stake and burning her, and of course, as you can imagine, even as she burned, she healed. In a rage, Roderick pulled out his sword and ran her through. To his surprise, Tulis's bonds fell away. She drew the sword out of her own chest and put an end to Roderick herself. Tulis congratulated the revolutionaries for their revolution and then ascended to join, or perhaps rejoin, the other gods of Porphyria. Now, Tulis is chaotic good. Her domains are liberation, nobility, protection, and strength, with the subdomains defense, freedom, martyr, and purity. Her favorite weapon is the longsword, and her symbol, an image of herself, tied to the stake with a sword through her stomach. And that's the end of Purple Duck Games. Here forward, it's all Black Dragon Gaming Homebrew. If you think you could do it better, if you do it different, put it in the comments. But to perform Tulis's deific obedience, you must carry two horns made from consecrated cattle horn and use both of them to perform a ceremony. For the first, bleed a small amount into the horn and offer it as a sacrifice to Tulis, eventually pouring it on the ground. Uncork the second and blow it as an active challenge or to announce your presence as one who is willing to lay their life down for the cause. If you are challenged during this time, you are expected to defend yourself. You must not waste your life needlessly, but if your death will achieve a greater goal, you are expected to die well. In return, Gain a plus one bonus on initiative rolls now. Evangelist boons. It's cure light wounds thrice a day, celestial healing twice a day, or blood of the martyr, but you can only target yourself once a day. At 16th level, anytime you are healed to full hit points by a spell or spell-like ability, your skin hardens as rapid scarification occurs. This causes you to gain a permanent plus one bonus to your natural armor. This bonus can never be higher than one-fourth your character level, rounded down. Finally, at 20th level, as a standard action, you become an avatar of the martyr herself. For a number of rounds equal to your charisma modifier, you gain immunity to all elemental damage and regeneration equal to however much damage you have currently taken. This regeneration cannot be shut off by any means, but after the effect ends, you fall unconscious for a number of days equal to the rounds spent using that ability. No save. For the Exalted Boons, it's Invigorate, thrice a day, Blessing of Liberty, twice a day, or Gaseous Form, once a day. At 16th level, you are constantly under the effects of a Freedom of Movement spell, though its presence cannot be detected by Detect Magic and the like, unless the caster succeeds at a DC 13 plus your Hit Dice caster level check. Whenever an opponent would have you in an effect that Freedom of Movement would allow you to escape from, such as a Grapple, 
you regain a number of hit points equal to your charisma modifier plus your hit dice, and at 20th level, that freedom of movement effect extends to all your allies affected by your bardic performance or within 20 feet, whichever is greater. Sentinel boons. It's true strike thrice a day, ally across time twice a day or once a day in visibility sphere. At 16th level, a number of times per day equal to your charisma modifier, you can cause spells you cast that target only you to target all allies within 20 feet in addition to yourself. Doing so taxes your ability to cast spells and you must expend two spell slots or two spells per day to do so. And at 20th level, spells you cast on yourself that target allies in addition to yourself via your boon no longer have that additional cost. Now, of course, we're chaotic good, so no paladin code this time, but Planar Adventures is passing out boons, and some of the gods are definitely just, hey, have a flat plus one to an ability score. We'll do that for Tulis. Boom, plus one to charisma. Anytime you do a particularly noble or great thing for the faith. Now, to me, Tulis feels like a combination of the cardinal martyr Vildeus, as well as Milani, kind of just rolled together and thrown into chaotic good, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And as I read Tulis's entry in the Gods of Porphyria, I have to say that there's probably people out there who have been victims of abuse, who, much in the same way that we have like Arche, or even now Sukio, for those of us who have been repressed or hurt, to find a little bit of representation slash solace in, and I'm not necessarily gonna dive too far down that rabbit hole. However, I will say that I think it's a sweet, amazing thing that these deities exist, especially outside of the realm of Paizo. I haven't read through all of it yet, though I plan to, but this book has a bajillion brand new deities waiting for your game, and deities are probably the easiest thing to slide into a game. It's not like you're trying to play a race from a video game. It's not like you want to take everyone to a setting. No, it's literally just you worship a different invisible for as far as the game is concerned, unless the GM brings the deity in directly force, and in return they give you some powers and stuff. Not the worst thing in the world. And again, our game becomes richer the more of these sorts of things you can bring in. Now, if I were to play a character who worshiped Tulis, Again, it feels like Vildeus meets Milani. We're righteously riding around freeing the slaves, freeing the oppressed, causing the revolution. And also one is reminded of Joan of Arc a little bit in the concept of the woman burned at the stake or maybe like the witches of Salem. And if I were to GM for a character who worshiped Tulis, though of course Tulis could heal herself, these people could not. And throwing a Joan of Arc-esque figure into a campaign, a rallying force for a rebellion that eventually, you know, is just burned at the stake. Doesn't sound like the worst idea. Yeah, maybe I've played too much Age of Empires too. Haven't we all? Anyway, that's all we got today. What do you guys think about this third party deity? Would you worship her? Would you worship any of the gods of Porphyria? Or are there any other third party deities? that you've included in your games and how did it affect them? Let me know in the comments. As always, we'll keep that conversation rolling on, but again, that's all we have for today. As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you wanna see more. We've got not one, not two, but three patron requests coming down the line in our next three weeks. Next week is a very special one, a patron request for a patron's birthday. We're home brewing up. Billiken. See you then.